Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Himes. I'm here representing Big Tent today. Uh, Big Tent is a community of women focused on protecting our democracy. And we provide carefully curated education, activism, training, and opportunities, as well as, of course, a wonderful sense of community. We're from all over the country, and we include Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Uh, full disclosure, I am also married to Congressman Jim Himes from Connecticut. So um, like Secretary Benson, I see you know democracy in action from the inside, and it can be a scary sight sometimes, but I'm um, both concerned about the direction our country's going, but also very, very hopeful and um, feeling good about the activism that we see. Uh, including all the people who've joined this call. So thank you, Secretary Benson, for joining us today. Really thrilled you're here. Thank you for having um, me. It's good to be here. So Secretary Benson has been in that role since 2018. Uh, she's a national voting rights expert who was just awarded the JFK Profile in Courage Award. Uh, because of her actions uh, protecting the 2020 election as armed protesters rallied around her home in Detroit. She's worked tirelessly in Michigan to make elections secure and to make voting accessible. And in the 2020 election, thanks to all her efforts, Michigan shattered records for voter turnout. There were 5.5 million Michiganders who voted. That's just amazing. Secretary Benson graduated from Wellesley College, Oxford University and Harvard Law School. She worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center as an investigative journalist and then at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. I could go on and on and on um, talking about the many accomplishments, but I know we all want to hear from Secretary Benson. Um, so, uh, and just a heads up before um, you dive into your presentation, um, we're going to let Secretary Benson speak till about probably 1240, 1235, and then we'll do some Q&A. So please put your questions in the chat. I'm gonna do my best to get to as many of them as I can, um, but please be gentle if I don't get to yours. Um, and then we'll discuss some action items, um, helping you guys figure out ways that you can engage in protecting democracy directly. And then we'll wrap it up. So Secretary Benson, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for having me. Uh, it's really great to be here with all of you today to talk about really one of the most important issues of the moment, uh, which is protecting our democracy. And we've said in many ways that the 2022 election uh, is one that will determine the an impact on all of our fundamental rights and freedoms moving forward. And I want to talk to you a little bit about why that is and why Michigan in particular is ground zero. Uh, now in 2018, I was, uh, well, I'll take a, take a few steps back. I was I actually started my career at the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and I, I investigated hate groups and hate crimes around the country and saw firsthand how much we still have to do to overcome uh, the structural racism that has impeded the progress of really all of us, uh, including many of our most marginalized communities. And you know, from there, I was also really instilled with this deep sense of recognition and, and inspiration to continue the work of those who stood on at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in uh, 1965 uh, to ensure that we would simply be able to have a right to vote uh, and that one that everyone uh, could uh, uh, have access to and that that one person one vote principle in our constitution was a reality for everyone. Uh, and so I became a lawyer because I thought the best way I could protect democracy with my career and really continue the work of those who've come before us is by suing our way to protecting the right to vote and uh, and and promoting equality for all. Uh, and I also say this as the daughter of two special education teachers who taught me at a young age that uh, everyone uh, should have and needs to have a seat at the table if our educational system and every our economy and everything else is going to function and flourish. And I always saw the best chance for us having equity and everyone having equal access to uh, opportunity in our country as starting with equal access to the vote. Then the 2000 election happened. I know that was almost 22 years ago now. We saw for the first time how a Secretary of State named Katherine Harris made decisions that impeded the and interfered with the results of a presidential election. 
And at that moment in that time, our country was divided uniquely uh, and uh, uh, the, the presidential election of, 20, of 2000 reflected that. Um, but lo and behold, we can never imagine 20 years later, our country being divided as it is today uh, and also the challenges that we faced in 2020 which was really a nationally coordinated effort to overturn the results of a legitimate presidential election. Now I was elected to secretary to be secretary of state in Michigan in 2018 on the hills uh, alongside two amazing women, our great governor Gretchen Whitmer and our attorney general Dana Nessel. Uh, and as a team, we've worked to expand democracy in our state. And really the first part of our term prior to 2020 uh, I spent implementing things like no reason absentee voting, giving everyone a right to be able to vote from home, enabling citizens to register to vote up to and on election day itself, and also creating automatic voter registration so that citizens could be automatically registered to vote if they were eligible whenever they got a state ID or driver's license. These were common sense things that increased access to our democracy but also prepared us for what we endured in 2020. And that really began in March of 2020 when everything changed. And in a sea of uncertainty and chaos that are, uh, affected our health system, our educational system, uh, and every, everything else that uh, we rely upon and live with, I needed to, and I wanted to, as the Secretary of State, the Chief Election Officer in the state of Michigan, make sure citizens had the confidence and clarity that even, if with, even with everything changing, their vote would still count. And so we worked for the eight months from March until November of 2020 to basically build out an infrastructure that would enable citizens to have options to vote, to vote from home in the midst of a pandemic. And even when it looked like, and, and it did evolve that the president of the United States would hamper and impede the ability of the postal service to be a reliable way of returning ballots uh, from voters who had a right to return them through the mail. We implemented drop boxes, secure drop boxes all across the state, over a thousand, uh, so that citizens would have a place, a reliable place to drop off their ballot and have affirmation that it would count. All of that led up to an extremely smooth election in November of 2020, despite many concerns and even a kidnapping attempt on our own governor a few weeks prior to election day, we had a very smooth election. And it was one in which more people voted than ever before on both sides of the aisle. 5.5 million citizens voted in the midst of a pandemic and a full 3.3 million of them were able to vote from home. Uh, they chose to do that. They had the right to do that under Michigan's law. And then we worked to build out a system that would ensure, because you, you have to uh, validate and tabulate ballots in a different way when they're sent through the mail or voted absentee. We built out a system to prepare for that significant increase of ballots sent through the mail. In other words, the trains ran on time. We had a successful smooth election. It was really one of the most secure and smooth elections we've had in our state its history, uh, and it was underscored by the fact that we had so many people vote. And then, once it was declared who the unofficial winner was in Michigan, everything changed. And about Thursday after Election Day, that first week in November, hundreds of people showed up outside TCF Center, uh, which is the area, the convention center in Detroit, where Detroit's ballots were being securely counted and tabulated. They demanded and tried to interfere with the counting process, accusing poll workers, people who have spent their lives in many ways uh, serving at the polls on election day uh, and, uh, and know what they're doing, uh, accusing them of um, some sort of, sort of malfeasance without any proof. And that's when we saw the beginning of what we endured for the months followed and really have been enduring ever since, uh, that essentially there was a coordinated effort to interfere with the tabulation of valid votes in our state. And then after that failed, trying to then interfere with the certification process of our votes at this local and state level. And then when that failed and then our election was certified, there was an attempt to submit an alternate slate of electors with people showing up outside our state capitol the day the electoral college votes were being officially transmitted to the National Archives uh, to claim falsely that they were the right electors and they were there to support then President Trump. And that continued to escalate where there were people outside my home in December not in a late December evening, demanding that I block the election results up until and including the tragedy at our U.S. Capitol on January 6th. As that proceeded, really the first time in our country's history where there was a coordinated effort, nationally coordinated effort, to use the court system, to use state legislatures and sham legislative hearings, uh, to use the media, to use uh, and interfere with the actual operations of elections, all to 
not just try to overturn the results of a legitimate presidential election, but to de delegitimize the entire system so that even if and when that effort to overturn election results was unsuccessful, there was left in the wake so much confusion and chaos that democracy would be significantly damaged, and indeed it was. Now, we're gonna talk about 2022, but I wanna emphasize throughout everything I just described, the person who's now on the other side running to replace me was front and center, outside actually TCF trying to stop and interfere with the counting of valid votes in Detroit. Part of the way in which our challenges facing democracy have escalated since then has been in an effort to replace those of us who stood guard on either side of the aisle to protect the results and the will of the people in 2020, to now replace us with people who were trying to interfere with those results like my opponent here in Michigan, who was recruited and handpicked by the former president to be the nominee uh, in an effort to take over this office and be poised to overturn or, or not certify election results that she or her benefactor, the former president, disagree with in 2024. Now, though the 2020 election is behind us, those attacks on our democracy, like I just described, are escalating. And they're escalating in three ways. One, in an effort to continue to sow seeds of doubt, spread lies and misinformation about the veracity and the integrity and the security of our elections. Those lies are designed to, in some ways, raise money and keep the story alive out there, but also really ultimately delegitimize democracy in the eyes of many, causing them to either disengage or be prepared to try to fight to overturn election results they disagree with in the future. The second thing we've seen happen is people trying to change the rules. And we've seen this in Georgia, we've seen this in Texas, we've seen this in Arizona, we've seen this in Michigan. Uh, really many of the critical swing battleground states in 2020 have now seen state legislators try to change the rules of the game to make it more difficult to vote, more difficult for us to run elections, and also more difficult for us to ensure that when the ballots are counted successfully, that we can securely protect those results from nefarious partisan efforts to block the certification of accurate election results. And then finally, what is perhaps the most pernicious element of the attacks on democracy today is to, in recognition of the fact of the, the democracy prevailed in 2020 because people of integrity on both sides of the aisle did the right thing and followed the law. To then replace us, replace the referees with those who'd be willing to skirt the law or block certification of election results or implement confusing election changes or simply just sow seeds of doubt from this platform about the integrity of our elections in order to further a political partisan agenda that doesn't reflect the will of the people. Now, as we see other institutions at the federal level also making decisions like limiting freedom of choice and our right to privacy under the Constitution long held in our law, now, as we see those uh, principles potentially being overturned, even though they're not supported, even though those decisions aren't supported by the majority of people in our country, that also shows what is on the horizon, that this attack on democracy is not just, although it's perniciously enough, an attack on the base, basic institutions of who we are as Americans, who we are in a constitutional republic like this, where one person, one vote has been the law of the land since its inception. It's not only attack on those fundamental pieces of who we are and our building blocks of democracy, it's an attack on our fundamental rights and freedoms that is playing out in the US Supreme Court as we speak, and also is a reflection of what happens when, not on the, when the majority of people are either blocked from participating in their democracy or have given up hope and disengaged so much that a true minority will that doesn't represent what every voice wants takes charge. So that's what we're facing with now. And as we look to the 2022 election and the 2024 election on the horizon after that, I know two things. Number one, everything we dealt with in 2020, everything we overcame, and it truly was the most scrutinized election in our lifetime, that, and we overcame that successfully, all of those challenges will return in 2024. And they will be better funded, more sophisticated, more organized, and will have the benefit of building over these last few years towards a goal of potentially being able to be successful on a January 6th in the future where they were unsuccessful in 2020. Secondly, however, the path towards the, the enabling of a successful overturning of election results in 2024 and the successful diminishment of voter participation in 2024, the path 
towards that runs right through the 2022 election, where the selection of the players who will be on the field to either protect or harm democracy in 2024 will be chosen by voters all around our country. And so our challenge between now and November is to make sure every citizen in this country, regardless of what political party they affiliate with, understand that truly our democracy is on the ballot this fall, our fundamental rights and freedoms are on the ballot this fall, and truly our ability to ensure that we can have and live in a country where every voice is heard and every vote is counted and the people have the power over politicians in, in Lansing or, in, or Washington. That is all gonna be determined by who shows up on election day this November and whether or not they recognize the impact of their choice between truth versus lies, facts versus falsehoods, falsehoods, and democracy versus authoritarianism. So our job between now and then is to simply tell the truth, let it make sure everyone knows what's at stake this fall, and make sure everyone knows the impact of the decisions they'll be making, that if they stay home, it's as good as handing our democracy and their rights over to someone who doesn't have their best interests in mind. But if we show up, and if we show up like we showed up in 2020, in 2018, we can again withstand this attack on democracy, and I hope emerge out of this moment with a stronger, more robust, and healthier democracy than ever before, with more people engaged, more people focused, and more people recognizing the need for all of us to defend and protect every voice and every vote in every election. Um, so that's our charge. Thank you for having me and for hosting this important conversation uh, and for being a part of this national nonpartisan coalition, this effort that we must build to protect our democracy. When I look ahead at what we must do, it's tiring. I am tired. A lot of people are tired. It has been an exhausting few years. But all I know is that the people who stood on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965 were tired too, but they marched forward anyway. And because they did, we have a Voting Rights Act, we have a democracy that's open to all, and we owe it to them and to every freedom fighter who's come before them and since to continue that march, to continue that fight in moments like these. If we do that, we will prevail. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much. I mean, there's so much in there and I'm now terrified again but also hopeful. So we're not gonna dwell on the being terrified part, right? We're gonna think about um, what we can do to address all of these threats to our democracy, because you're right, it is, have you, as I think you've said, it is a five alarm fire. Um, so let's get to some questions. I thought we might start um, by just debunking some radical Republican facts because facts really are on our side. And the more that we can message around good, not good facts, facts, um, I think the better off we'll be. So this can be a speed round if you want or take time to answer, it's, it's totally up to you. Um, does voter fraud in Michigan and elsewhere currently create a real risk to our elections? No, it doesn't. And it doesn't because of really two things. One, there's not a lot of people trying to commit it. But, but secondly, if they were to do it, we would catch it. We actually have secure protocols in place to validate every ballot uh, before it's counted. So even if someone was going to dump, even though there's, this hasn't happened, a bunch of fake ballots in, in a drop box, they wouldn't be counted because they wouldn't be validated because you have to have a voter's valid signature on that ballot. And in the case where signatures are uh, not clearly matching, clerks follow up with the voters themselves and say, hey, was this really you? So essentially, if there was fraud, and if there is fraud, we catch it, we prosecute it, and we take we take it very seriously. And that's exactly why citizens can have confidence in the integrity of our elections, because we're on guard protecting that integrity as well as protecting access to the vote. Excellent. Um, okay, this is a really common one. Most of us probably know the answer, but I just wanna make sure that we all do know the answer. Why shouldn't we ask voters to provide ID when you need an idea to get in on airplane? Well, nearly every state in this country, I think every state identifies voters prior to giving them a ballot. And then in many cases, if they vote absentee, identifies them again a second time after receiving their ballot and counting it. So in other words, we, we do have voter ID. The debate seems to circuit, circulate around how many types and what type of identification are we going to accept with the debate oftentimes under the guise of saying, hey, we need voter ID, ignoring the fact that we already have it. 
uh, in Michigan and elsewhere, uh, then they use that to say, and the only types of ID that will count are XYZ, a driver's license, which not everyone has, for example. Uh, and that's where you get into challenges. So the, the best identification programs for voters, and I agree, we need them, are ones that ensure that whatever ID is required does not block someone from voting. In some cases, that's someone's signature. That's their identification. In some cases, it's a photo ID. In some cases, it's a uh, verification of their address. There are a lot of different ways you can confirm someone's identity and deter fraud. And the data shows that what we have in Michigan, uh, which is a hybrid of photo ID and signature, if one doesn't show an ID or have one, is the most reliable way to ensure everyone identifies themselves before voting and, and their identity is verified. And then in addition to that, uh, it's, it's an identification process that doesn't unnecessarily block anyone from voting, which again is their fundamental right. Um. Are early voting days a threat? Early voting days simply make voting more convenient for our citizens. It's one of the reasons why voters support them in so many ways. We see it playing out in Georgia right now. We saw it in Ohio and Florida, North Carolina. Uh, so uh, allowing people to vote prior to election day, if, if they choose to do so securely and accessibly, is one of the ways democracy has evolved out of the sort of Tuesday only and the second Tuesday after the first Monday in November uh, rule that was established when we were an agrarian society and that was farmer's day off. It's basically a compromise uh, that, that recognizes not everyone can get to a ballot box or a polling place on a Tuesday in a November, uh, but we don't want them to lose their right to vote as a result of that. And so you create more opportunities, more options for people to vote prior to election day. Uh, and the results still don't become final until every vote is counted after the, the polls close or the, the deadline passes uh, in, uh, in that election. So it's a good thing. It's one that vo voters on both sides of the aisle support. And that the data backs up is something that increases voter engagement and turnout. Great. Last one. Um, cleaning up the voter rolls. A lot of people on the other side of the aisle seem to think that the voter rolls are laden with opportunities for fraud. Yeah. So talk about that and how we can do that in a way that doesn't disenfranchise a lot of people. Well, we actually, it, I'm really proud that in Michigan, uh, we have created this multi-tiered system to ensure the accuracy of our voter rolls uh, that enables people who are eligible to be registered to get registered either on election day or automatically when they get their driver's license or state ID. Uh, also removes people when they move out of town or move out of the state uh, and then uh, ensures that after a long time if people you know have either passed away or have not participated then they are also removed but if for any reason someone is wrongly removed they can simply just get back on on election day itself or whenever they would show up to vote so in other words uh, we have one of the most accurate voter lists in our state's history uh, in part because one of the first things I did when I became Secretary of State was join ERIC, a, it's called the Electronic Registration Information Center. And it's a consortium of all the states, uh, many states in the country, so that when someone moves to another state in that consortium, we hear about it and we can update their voter registration accordingly. We also, every two weeks, get an update from the Social Security Division of the federal government when someone passes away so that we can update our files accordingly. And then even if someone remains on the list to, for whatever reason, uh, oh, I should say we also did a mailing to all voters, uh, quite notorious one in 2020, where we were mailing people absentee ballot request forms. That also enabled us when something bounced back to identify someone as having moved, and that enabled us to update their registration appropriately. Uh, and then finally, all of that to say, uh, if someone is still on the rolls who is no longer eligible to vote uh, and they show up, there's a verification process, particularly if they are voting absentee, to ensure that uh, they have to reaffirm their identity and their residency in order to vote. Uh, and, uh, and so all of that to say is we have an accurate list. We, we inherited a very messy list. Uh, and it's really unfortunate. I think it's an example of a lot of the allegations and misinformation out there is really rooted in the fact that it's a very complicated process to administer elections with many details and many data points. 
Uh, and sometimes people don't understand all those data points and they just hear a sensationalized headline and accept it as fact. Um, and so that's why we also encourage everyone to simply just ask questions of your local clerks. Uh, go to our website as well, which explains a lot of these things or other questions that you may hear about, because we want people to have faith in the elections process and understand all the intricacies, um, but also see that indeed uh, we are doing everything we can, in fact, more than ever has been done before to increase the accuracy of our lists, make sure that only eligible voters are voting, and also ensure that every eligible voter has access to the vote. Excellent. Um, and just a reminder to people that and I'm sure everybody knows this, but you know, you never assume anything in this world, but you know, this, the election laws are state, they're controlled at the state level, right? Sadly, no new voting laws have passed through Congress um, and state voting laws are all over the map, right? And there's a lot of new, as you've described, sort of threatening laws that are potentially going to be passed or already have passed. And I was reading how Michigan actually has a really unique constitutional provision to circumvent a veto by the governor. And remember in Michigan, the, the legislature is controlled by Republicans. There's a group uh, collecting signatures for the Secure Michigan Vote Petition. And they're hoping to you know, use that provision to radically change the election laws in November, which would have a really horrifying impact, I think. So can you talk to us about that effort as an example of why it's so important for us to really pay attention to state level elections. Yeah, uh, it's called, um, uh, interestingly, the Secure My Vote Initiative. And it is one that is really furthering and trying to codify a lot of the, the falsehoods and misinformation that have been circulating in the past several years with an eye, with a, with a eye towards making it more difficult for people to vote from home. Uh, essentially, and a number of other things, and making it easier to potentially overturn election results if they can claim that irregularities occurred, uh, which is you know, part of the strategy, uh, and and to falsely claim there are irregularities and use that that those false claims to then justify not certifying the election, uh, and so uh, all that is all that to say is I. Um, uh, in, in, uh, I, I oversee the, the signature verification process of uh, petitions, and so I've stayed uh, distant from the petition itself, uh, but there have been there is a lot out there describing the provisions and the ways in which those provisions would complicate or make it more difficult for us to run elections, uh, including banning uh, in-kind gifts from uh, schools and other entities that oftentimes enable polling places to be open. And uh, when schools donate their space, for example, that would be banned under the, the provision. So it ultimately just makes it more difficult for us to run elections. Now, what, why and how could this become law? Well, under Michigan law, uh, as you mentioned, if voters uh, collect a petition with about 300,000, 400,000 signatures, about 4% of the voting age population, they can present, present that petition to the uh, state legislature and the state legislature would then um, adopt it and without needing a governor's signature for it to become law. Now, if and when that happens with this particular petition, I imagine there would be several legal challenges because it's not clear the petition even is legal in what it tries to do under our state constitutional protections for absentee voting. But in addition to that, under the timing of where we are right now with regards to our election being six months away, it would under no circumstance, none of those changes, even if they passed and became law and withstood legal challenges, they would not go into effect until 2024. Uh, and so we're still seeing how everything plays out, but more what we've seen a lot is voters being lied to about what the petition is about. Uh, people being told sign this, it supports voting when it really makes voting a lot more difficult. Uh, and so we also suspect voters are being misled uh, to sign a petition. Uh, and unfortunately under Michigan law, that is permissible uh, at, at this point. Uh, and so we'll see how everything plays out. Uh, we'll see over the next few months, uh, but I again anticipate there will be legal challenges to any petition that comes through that has um, you know, potential violations of our state constitutional protections for voters. Okay, um, I think we're gonna have to wrap up early. I see a, um, in the chat, so at 12.45. So um, I'm glad you're gonna be busy doing the people's work. Um, so let's see, let's get to some, I know a lot of people are, I'll get to the chat questions. How can, from Ellie Goldberg, great question. How can poll workers be protected from personal threats and assaults? Isn't that what, 
is that what's making people reluctant to work at the polls? Well, I'm, I'm really proud that we've recruited almost 50,000 new election workers over the past several years since 2020. Uh, 30,000 were recruited in particular for 2020. And um, what we're seeing is people are, are more eager to work um, and defend democracy and work at the polls. We really call on everyone to do that, to take seriously the role and the opportunity to serve as an election worker right now. We need people to, to do that. And we are seeing people step up in a way that's really inspiring. Um, that said, there are also a lot of threats facing election officials, clerks, local clerks, as well as poll workers. And I'm working directly with the attorney general to uh, ensure that we have legal protections in place. We're having meetings with local election officials and law enforcement to ensure a direct line of communication of protection, uh, including on election day itself. And so we're, we're hoping uh, that this continues to be a protective space uh, and we're providing those protections. We understand that for whatever reasons, whether it was during the height of COVID or now people are, are who have been longtime election workers are choosing no, lo no longer to serve, but we find they're also being replaced by people who are eager to step up and serve during times like these. All that to say is I'm also part of a network called the Election Official Defense Network. And it's a network of attorneys that if and when a local election official or a poll worker encounters or needs some sort of legal assistance or protections, they actually step in uh, and provide that. Um, but, but make no mistake, when we hear about threats to our election officials today, there are direct threats of violence, as many of us have encountered, but there are also threats of uh, legal actions or other types of uh, harassment that uh, create and engender fear and anxiety among many folks who are simply just trying to do their job and make democracy work for everyone. And so that is a very real stress right now. Uh, it's one that is being borne by too few who are doing too much for our democracy. Uh, and one of the best ways we all can be a part of addressing it is by standing up to serve alongside these great heroes of democracy and ourselves become election workers and poll workers uh, so that uh, we all take a stand to protect democracy and make sure it works on election day and beyond. Okay. Um, I think we have a time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so let's talk about the danger of misinformation, which is everywhere, right? And it really poses a threat to the peaceful transfer of power, the safe county of ballots issue, the certification process, right? All the lies being spread by radical Republicans, by your opponent. How do we fight that? And how do we... Um, message effectively so that we safeguard that? I mean, do you, you know, they talk about messaging that you have to have a trusted messenger, right? So do you work with organizations on the ground that are really in the communities or what's your advice on that? Well, you're right. Trusted messengers, trusted voices are key. And in many cases, as many of you all know today, are uh, those in the political arena are not the most trusted voices um, is a result of a lot of the misinformation that has flown through our communities for so long. And so one of the, one of the things we start with is the recognition, first and foremost, that we can't forget that the, the truth is on our side. The facts, the data, um, you know, and all, all of the, um, the, the data points are on the side of democracy and are on the side of our elections being ones that are an accurate reflection of the will of the people that must be defended. So we start from a baseline of truth. And then the next question is, what's the best way to communicate that? And first, there's been a lot of research done about the importance of going where people are and listening because these are people who have been misled and lied to by people they trust in their communities. Uh, and listening to their, you know, answering their questions as many have done uh, and, uh, and sought to do, providing factual information, encouraging them to, um, to question what they've been told and, and move forward um, in that sort of mode of critical thinking. But undoubtedly the voices of these conversations on the side of truth and democracy do have to be trusted messengers. They can be faith leaders. They can be community leaders. They can be educators. They can be sports figures, business leaders. Uh, and in particular, sports leaders and business leaders and educators, we have been working to train and support to encourage them uh, to, even if you own a business, hold a information session about elections and democracy, bring in a local election official and talk, have a conversation with folks uh, about our democracy and then invite people to serve as election workers so that they can see firsthand how the system works. So we've got to do that work. We've got to do that kind of you know, deprogramming of people who've been lied to by those they trust for too long. 
And uh, we're not going to convince everyone of the truth, that's reality, um, but we can uh, dedicate ourselves to continuing to spread that truth and to do so uh, in a way that is proactive uh, and uh, committed to ensuring that uh, we're doing everything we can to get the message out, building that nonpartisan coalition of voices uh, to, to amplify and project that, that truth. The last thing I'll say on that though, and this is critical, it recognizes that as we do all that, in many ways, we could be just shouting into a void. If Republicans, many Republicans, not all, but many Republicans choose instead of being truth tellers to further misinformation. We have people running for governor in the first line of a debate declaring that the 2020 election was not an accurate reflection of the will of the people when indeed it was. And as long as that's another reality in our political arena, we are going to be limited in how effective we can be at spreading that truth. And that is a tragedy. But I continue to call on all elected officials and candidates to tell the truth instead of doing what they feel is politically expedient. Uh, and the more we can peel off individuals who are willing to do that, we can, we can move forward. And one of the ways we do get more people committed to telling the truth as opposed to furthering misinformation to further their own political goals and partisan agendas is if voters hold those liars and deceivers accountable in November. We have an election this November in which voters can reject conspiracy theorists and deceivers and liars and instead support those on both sides of the aisle who have been committed to telling them the truth and true public service. Uh, if that happens, uh, then, or if, or if more people show up to re reject the election deniers than those who show up to support them, uh, then we actually can move forward out of this moment with more people getting access to that truth and more leaders repeating it. But it's going to take voters also making a very clear stance in November and drawing a line in the sand and saying, we're tired of being lied to. Uh, we're tired of you trying to deceive us. Uh, and that is, um, uh, you know, work we have to do between now and November, but that's also why we say, democracy is on the ballot this year. And it is an incredible opportunity, but also an incredible challenge uh, for us to engage all of all citizens all across this country in every state in embracing this opportunity to reject the misinformation and embrace the truth this year. Well, that is beautiful. And I think, I'm so sorry you have to leave, um, but I thank you so much. What a great way to end this part of our conversation. I hope a lot of people on the call will stick around um, we've got some more stuff to share with you about upcoming events. Thank you so much, Secretary Benson. I wish you all the luck in leading your state to have a wonderful, safe, secure election. Um, I, she has written a book. You can find it. Is it on Amazon? I believe? It's from 2008, but yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's still out there. Yeah, it, it's on about, but it's about secretaries of state and how... Yeah. Uh, they continue to serve as guardians of the democratic process, even back in 2008 when I wrote it. Well, and you were very prescient, you see. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been the case. I mean, 20, two, the 2000 election really, as I said, shed light on that reality. And I think more and more people are starting to see it. Uh, at the same time, more people who want to use these positions to undo democracy are also seeing that too. And it becomes essentially a battle between those two forces that is fought out, not just in these offices, but in the fight for attorney general seats. Uh, and of course, at the gubernatorial level, where in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, the governors appoint the secretaries of state. Uh, so um, so th there's lots of work for all of us to do. And every voter in every state in this country will have an opportunity to defend democracy this year. And if you would like to um, if you guys want to learn more about the work that Secretary Benson's doing, uh, please reach out to Emily. I think the email is in the chat. Yes, it's in the chat. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, as, she, as she just said, there's so much work to be done and across the country, but Michigan's a really key state, very interesting state, purple state. Um, and we wish you the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. For thanks for all us. the work you do, guys. And thanks for having me today. Good luck. Excuse. <laughs> Keep in touch. <laughs> And I guess going forward, um, hopefully people will stick on the call for a couple minutes more. I want to just um, thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Uh, we were just short on time there. Um, upcoming events. Let's see. Monday, May 16th. That's really soon, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We're doing a spotlight 
spotlight speakers, Ambassador Norm Eisen and Joy White Vance, who will discuss Norm Eisen's new book called Overcoming Trumpery. And um, it'll also, he'll also focus on the January 6th committee hearings coming up in June. So that's bound to be an awesome conversation. Please register for that. The link is now in the chat. Um, letter writing, Michigan, like, are you fired up? I am definitely gonna write some letters for Michigan. That is one way we can help protect democracy. And there's two things you can do. One, you could start writing letters right now, if you want. Um, Vanessa just put in the chat, the link, you can get tw batches of 20 at a time. Um, and then I hope you'll join us again on Tuesday, May 24th at noon. We'll be hosting our next Zoom social letter writing session. And again, we're working with Vote Forward, which is just a really impactful organization. You know that the letters you're writing will actually get people out to vote and really make a difference. And that's what this is all about in November. We have the right message. We have the right policies. We have the numbers. We just have to get people out to vote. So write the letters, get these underrepresented voters in Michigan to go to the polls. Um, so ask for the letters now, join us on the 24th, register now for that event too. And let's do it. Let's make this happen. Let's protect and save democracy. Thank you all. I look forward to seeing you uh, in the near future. Have a great day, everyone.